Thank you, Athos and Bob. So uh, in the spirit of disclosures, first I want to apologize uh, to all Canadians in the audience because Eric Benchimol came up to me after uh, the last session and said, you know, the rate of smoking in the U.S. is 17% and Canada's 16%. So I definitely got that wrong, so I apologize. Um, the, uh, the second disclosure is I was so excited when the reception outside had uh, mustard and pretzels, but they didn't have any beer. So I, 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 I want to disclose I was disappointed. Okay. So, um, you know, it, 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 I was um, humbled when I had to debate Ted, you know, because he's a Midwesterner. He speaks so softly and slowly. He's always in control, you know. So uh, this is a daunting assignment. So thank you for the, uh, for the privilege of uh, debating Ted Denson. So let, let, let's talk about vetalizumab and pediatric uh, IBD. So, you know, it, it, it feels great to be at the cutting edge, right, and, until you get cut. So um, I learned that the hard way. The first part of my career um, was uh, uh, the medical director of the liver transplant program at Sinai. And it was right around the time that Tom Starzl brought over this amazing compound called FK506. And I was in the audience when he introduced it and said, the best thing about this is we haven't seen any side effects yet. Um, and I said, wow, that's great. This is going to be really cool. And then um, the first 10 patients that I put on the drug needed uh, dialysis. And in fact, people would ask me, what are you using for immunosuppression? I said, oh, FK and dialysis. <coughs> I thought they went together. And then we, realized, <laughs> then we realized it was 10 times more potent than cyclosporin. And we were dosing it like cyclosporin. And we really needed to cut the dose um, by 90% uh, to get the same efficacy with, with greater safety. So um, as Ted alluded to, it, it, we, you know, um, we don't have all the safety data yet, and that's certainly going to give us pause, but we'll come later to the consensus, and I will also disclose then all the patients that I already have on VETO. So um, it's nice to have another agent, but let's think about where we want to position it. Maybe that's where we're best talking about. So we're going to show you exactly the same slides and give us our sp you our spin. Um, so we recognize that anti-TNF therapy is very effective. Um, we recognize, as we've talked about the last two days, we have a lot of other effective therapies for inflammatory bowel disease, enteral nutrition, um, uh, the immunomodulators, uh, other biologics like uh, TNF, and now a whole new class. And where to position them is, is our real challenge. Um, we recognize that now we have two anti-TNFs, so our patients have the ability to choose between um, IV administration or subcutaneous administration, and it's always nice to have choices. Um, I'll point out, too, that when you compare, we, we were always cautioned, don't compare across trials. And we've also talked uh, several times, so it's really important to actually read the papers and get down to the nitty gritty. So remember that in, let's take Imagine, which was the pivotal trial for adalimumab, all the patients went through a four-week um, induction, and then everyone was randomized into the maintenance uh, uh, phase of the trial, as opposed to the vetalizumab trial, where it's what's called an enriched cohort. So those patients who got um, induced and responded were the ones who were randomized into the long-term maintenance. So when you're looking at the long-term outcomes, you're looking at an enriched cohort of those who already responded to the drug, as opposed to all comers. Um, here's the pediatric vetalizumab data, as um, uh, Ted has already uh, alluded to. Um, and you always have to be wary what comes in an empty box, because um, as I mentioned, I have my own uh, skeletons in the closet, and I'm sure Ted has his as well. So we want to be very careful about that. Um, Ted showed you this, and you know, it's like you, you look at the same coin, is it good or is it bad? I would say that 70% of patients with long-term um, remission staying on drug is pretty good. I, you know, 70% is not a bad number. I don't want to disclose what I got on my organic chemistry final, but I will tell you that 70% was better. So uh, approximately 50% required dose escalation, and in real life, that's another thing to remember in trials. When you have trial data, in a sense, that's your worst outcome, right? Because you're fixed per protocol. And as we learn about drugs, we learn how to use them better. And certainly, if we're now 15, 16 years into the anti-TNF data, and we've learned a lot about how to use these drugs well, whereas we've really learned nothing about how to optimize vetalizumab in the real world. We've recognized that body weight makes a difference, gender makes a difference, and really your, your TNF burden, so how much disease you have, um, perhaps reflected by C-reactive protein, will all guide us how to best uh, dose our patients with the anti-TNFs. Low albumin, I'm sure, is going to be important for any uh, monoclonal antibody. It's a marker of how fast you're probably losing the drug out of your bowel, and perhaps also how much inflammatory burden that you're uh, facing. 
We've talked a lot in these meetings about trough levels, and there are none available commercially yet for vetalizumab, although that will be coming, and certainly that will help us a lot. But um, we are still debating what's the best number we should be shooting for for each of our anti-TNFs. Certainly, we're going to be debating that even more about veto until the data is generated. So I have a drug that I can't optimize. will certainly give me pause about using it. Um, we talked about proactive testing versus reactive testing. We can get very smart with how to do our anti-TNFs. So at the end of the day, the take home on our anti-TNF therapy um, is that um, in fixed dosing, the worst case scenario is we can get 50% of our patients in remission. And if we start to dose optimize and, and monitor, um, we can use it best. And so why give up on a therapy that we really know how to use in, in favor of one that we don't yet know how to optimize? Uh, we talked about the data that came out of the risk cohort, um, and again, just to highlight that we can get 85% of patients in critical steroid-free remission um, if we position this therapy right. Yet more proof that we already know how to use these therapies very well, and so don't throw them out. Um, and for those of you who might think, well, I don't know, that sounds kind of cool. Why don't I move from um, an anti-TNF to... Um, to this uh, new type of mechanism of action, well, remember that it's a monoclonal antibody, and when you move from one to the other, you'll burn a bridge. Um, in one of his previous talks, Athos had highlighted the idea that your first kiss is your best, and your first biologic is probably going to be your best. Um, but remember, now we have to change our lexicon. For a long time, we've been calling biologic, a.k.a. anti-TNF, and now we have a new mechanism of action. So we really need to start talking about anti-TNFs and anti-adhesion uh, factors as opposed to just biologics as the, gro the gross, uh, the broad category. Thank you.